A long, long time ago, in the ever-expanding kingdom of Portillo's and Luminati's franchises known commonly as Chicagoland, I was a student at an all-boys high school sitting in homeroom and talking with a friend of mine. One day, the mood just struck me to ask him a question. If there were a button that you could press, and the next day you would wake up and everything would be the same, except that you'd be a girl, would you press it? Before he could answer, I went on to tell him that I would, I would totally press it. In fact, just about every part of my life would improve if I had been born as a girl. At the time, I mistakenly believed that the desire to be a girl was universally shared among guys, but we had all agreed to just to never talk about it ever, like it was some kind of big manly secret. I will never forget the look on his face, just perfectly split down the middle, one side looking confused and the other side smirking, anticipating a punchline that was not to come. He looked right into my eyes and thoughtfully said, Wow, that's wild. I have never thought about that before, even once in my life. And then we never spoke of it again. Years later, another friend would tell me that the desire to be a girl was in fact not universally shared among guys. In their view, perfectly cis people not only don't lose sleep imagining a button that turns them into a girl, the thought just never crosses their minds. But maybe that isn't entirely true. Seemingly for as long as there have been lines drawn between genders, there have been attempts to explain, blur, and cross them. Greek mythology in particular is ripe with stories dealing with the dynamics of sex and gender. Tiresias, for example, is transformed into a woman after killing a pair of snakes. Seven years later, Tiresias would kill another pair of snakes and turn back into a man, but only after having gotten married, had children, and seemingly fully acclimated to life as a woman. There's also the origin story of the minor god Hermaphroditus, the namesake of Hermaphrodite, or having both male and female characteristics. A nymph falls in love with a man after seeing him bathing and prays that the two of them will be together forever. The ever excessively literal gods hear her prayer and fusion dance the two of them into one being with both masculine and feminine features. Seeing their reflection in the pool, Hermaphroditus is actually pretty cool with it. And then the myth goes on to explain that from that point on, anyone who would bathe in that pool would be similarly transformed. Ancient Greeks didn't have the same concepts of sex and gender that we do now, but homosexual and gender diverse people did exist. The story of Hermaphroditus could be taken as an explanation for why intersex people exist. Tiresias' story is about a person who crosses gendered lines and comes back again. Even the Greek creation myth tries to explain same-sex attraction. Prometheus is hard at work shaping humanity out of clay when he's interrupted by Dionysus. The two of them go on to throw an absolutely legendary rager. Then, like an undergrad coming back home after a party only to remember that they have an essay due in six hours, Prometheus went right back to work, leaving some people with mismatched hearts and bodies. It's a narrative that actually rhymes with some of the born-in-the-wrong-body-styled narratives that you might hear today. These stories have several things in common. First, how the subject of the story feels about their transformation isn't mentioned even if the transformation itself is usually depicted as a good thing. The subjects of these stories also have no choice in the matter. I mean, what agency could a mortal hope to have against very literal divine intervention? Whatever happens to them happens, and that's it. The real focus is on how the story helps to explain something to the person hearing it. Many hundreds of years later, people still use storytelling to play with gender. Gary Gygax's infamous Dungeons & Dragons module, The Tome of Horrors, is full of elaborate traps, not the least of which is the magic portal that changes a character's alignment and sex. You might think that, logically, going back through the portal would reverse the effect, but this is the Tome of Horrors. Players that do that will find their characters teleported back to the start of the dungeon, naked as the day they were born, albeit with a different gender and substantially different outlook on life. The Dungeons & Dragons-based game series Baldur's Gate has its own take on the concept. 
early into the first game, the player might encounter a hostile ogre that will drop two unidentified magical belts. Putting on one of them will quickly reveal it as the cursed girdle of masculinity and femininity. Anyone who wears it will have their sex reversed, but noticeably their voice will not change, so everyone around them will presumably know what happened. As a cursed item, it's also impossible to remove without a spell or money to pay a priest, both of which the player is unlikely to have on hand that early in the game. In the second game of the series, the player may recruit Edwin Odysseion an evil wizard devoid of any redeeming qualities aside from his specifically being an especially powerful evil wizard. Edwin will ask the player to help him acquire something called the Nether Scroll. If you do decide to help him find it, he'll take it for himself and dramatically monologue about his upcoming rise to power before reading from the scroll. To his surprise, and the amusement of any party members that dislike Edwin, which is almost all of them, the spell transforms him into a woman. While the curse is undone at the conclusion of that quest, Edwin's epilogue in the expansion Throne of Ball has Edwin once again turned into a woman, this time seemingly permanently after challenging the Chosen of the Goddess of Magic to a duel and losing. The epilogue closing with the line, Edwina is a very bitter woman. Like the Greek myths, the subject here has no agency in what happens to them. In fact, the Tome of Horrors even has a talking skeleton that will try to trick the players into entering the portal that transes their gender. Unlike the Greek myths that frame these transformations as a neutral or good thing for the person, the transformation here is both unwanted and negative. At best, it's a joke at a character's expense, and at worst, it's a humiliating punishment. It's also worth noting that it's specifically a man becoming a woman that's taken as a humiliation. It's not just Western creatives that have a history of playing with gender. Japan also has an extensive history of using performance to bridge the gender divide. The long-running Takarazuka Review Company, for example, was founded in 1913 and has remained in operation as one of the largest theater companies in Japan. In their productions, whether they be musicals, dramas, or dances, all of the roles are played by women. During the training process, performers decide whether they will play the roles of young women, mature women, or men. Their choice will stay with them during their tenure with the company. Performers that choose to take on the roles of men, or otokoyaku, can attract legions of adoring fans who will come to see their productions time and time again. It's important to understand that otokoyaku are doing more than just playing a man. For performers and fans alike, the theater is a separate space suspended from the world around it. And that separation allows the lines between femininity and masculinity to blur. An otokoyaku is not a woman playing a man playing a character, but rather a performer that is using the space of the stage to assume an idealized image of masculinity, importantly claiming masculinity, but not manhood. In doing so, Otokoyaku embody a unique sense of femme masculinity or masculine femininity. That's a framing that might typically be associated with the image of a butch lesbian, but these performances transcend sexuality and win over both men and women. It's the unique transformational power of the stage that has allowed the Takarazuka Review to exist for as long as it has. Or, as one critic put it, quote, if I wanted to see real men, I'd go to another theater." End quote. The image of a masculinity embodied separately from manhood isn't limited to the stage. Shoujo manga has a long history of playing with gender roles. Considered to be the first work of shoujo manga, Osamu Tezuka's Princess Knight began serialization in 1953 with an animation adaption following in 1967. Pulling direct inspiration from the Takarazuka Review, the series follows Sapphire, a princess born with both the pink heart of a girl and the blue heart of a boy. In order to inherit the throne, Sapphire must publicly present as a boy in order to prevent the villain from succeeding the throne while the same villain attempts to reveal her gender, making her ineligible for royal succession. Princess Knight was not only a financial success, it pried open the door for other works to explore gender dynamics in their storytelling. 
One such work is Ryoko Ikeda's The Rose of Versailles, which took inspiration from both the Takurazuka Review and Princess Knight, as well as Ikeda's own involvement with the Communist Party of Japan. Beginning serialization in 1972, the story is set both before and during a near-historical fantasy of the French Revolution. The series partially focuses on Oscar Francois de Jarges, or Lady Oscar. As the youngest of six daughters, Oscar was raised as a boy to serve as commander of the Royal Guard. In contrast to Princess Knight, Lady Oscar's gender is public knowledge. Without keeping her identity a secret, Oscar is free to embody the image of a masculine woman. In contrast, her love interest, Andre, is a feminine man of lower social status. Oscar's masculinity is so central to her identity as a character that genre critics interpret her relationship with Andre as an example of a relationship between men, as well as an early cornerstone of both the Bishonen character archetype as well as the boys love genre. Even if you just learned about the Rose of Versailles a minute or so ago, you've probably seen it referenced somewhere and just not realized it. As a fun example of how all these things feed back into each other, the Takarazuka Review's adaption of The Rose of Versailles remains one of the most iconic shows in the history of the theater. The impact of The Rose of Versailles was still being felt in 1996 when artist Saito Chiho and the production group Bipapas began work on revolutionary girl Utena. Also pulling inspiration from the Takarazuka Review, as well as from works like The Rose of Versailles and Princess Knight, the main character and namesake of the series, Tenjo Utna, aspires to become a prince after having encountered one in her childhood. She wears a boy's uniform to school, plays sports, and acts heroically. As the story unfolds, she's pulled into a series of sword duels to become the fiancé of the Rose Bride. Of the three series that I've mentioned so far, Utna is far and away the hardest to try and summarize neatly. As the series goes on, it becomes increasingly abstract and surreal, oftentimes borrowing the imagery of a stage production. There's also a whole episode about a character turning into a cow that's actually full of a lot of good character development, but that's a whole different subject. On its release, Utna quickly became and has remained a strong influence on other productions, perhaps seen most obviously in the series review Starlight. Princess Knight, The Rose of Versailles, and Revolutionary Girl Utna share some common threads. They all, for example, deal with the inherent homoeroticism of swords, but that's a topic for the next video. Each of these works depict an image of femme masculinity. Sapphire, Oscar, and Utna, in their own ways, subvert genre conventions around gender roles. When appraising these works, it's important to keep in mind the difference between manhood and masculinity. The same is true when talking about the Takarazuka Review that inspired these works. With the exception of trans men who have performed in the theater, Otokoyaku do not see themselves as men, despite having spent years refining their ability to depict an idealized masculinity. The gender bending here is contained entirely to the performance. Some Otokoyaku even go so far as to describe their preparation to cross into the performance space and embody a role as requiring them to kill their own sense of gender. There are, however, works that go a step beyond the dynamics of performance. Whether through technology, magic, literal divine intervention, or, well, really you could probably name just about anything and there's some story out there that fits the bill, these stories go a step beyond by actually changing a character's body. This might sound like a retread of the cursed girdle of masculinity and femininity. However, stories in this niche that I'm just going to call gender benders can use these embodied changes as a lens to explore a character's relationship with their body, with gender more broadly, as well as how they interact with other people and vice versa. There is a lot of rough to go through with this subgenre. Sometimes reading these stories can feel like playing Minesweeper and just waiting to turn a page into a mine of exploitation, but there are some diamonds in there, two of which that I'd like to spotlight here. So spoiler warning ahead for Shishunki Bitter Change and Until I Become Me. 
Masayoshi's Shishunki Bitter Change, translated as Puberty Bitter Change or Adolescence Bitter Change, began as a four-part webcomic published between 2012 and 2013. The story was later picked up for serialization in Comic Polaris from 2012 until 2019. There are a number of differences between the webcomic version and the serialization, so just to be clear, in this video I'm going to be talking about the serialization. Within this subgenre of gender benders, body swap scenarios are a crowded field. The titular swap itself is also more often than not played for comedy via embarrassing situations. The stories also tend to resolve things relatively quickly and neatly. What makes Shishunki Bitter Change stand out from the field is the combination of sincerity and thoughtfulness that it approaches the premise with. The story centers on Kimura Yuta and Utsuka Yui, two fourth grade classmates who absolutely cannot stand each other. One day, Yuta falls out of a tree, lands on Yui, and when they come to, they find themselves in each other's bodies. After an afternoon of unsuccessful attempts to undo whatever's happened to them, the two realize that their parents are probably wondering where it is that they are. After a quick crash course on how to impersonate each other at home, the two set off thinking that this will all resolve itself in another day or two. But a day turns into a week, a week turns into a month, and a month turns into years without a solution. The element of time also helps set Shishunki Bitter Change apart. Yui and Yuta spend years living each other's lives, only referring to each other with their birth names either in private or with Yuta's friend Kazuma who they let in on their situation. Everywhere else, they are fully in character, living as another person. Over time though, the line between the character that they are playing and who they really are becomes increasingly hard to draw. As the years pass, both Yui and Yuta grow and change physically and emotionally. Anticipating that they'll eventually be able to go back to their lives, they meet daily to update each other on the goings-on at home, at school, etc. The image of the two of them gradually outgrowing the increasingly cramped space underneath the goofy elephant slide is my favorite visual in the series. While not explicitly framed as a trans narrative, this series is a story about two cis kids suddenly experiencing something akin to what a trans kid might go through. Yui and Yuta never stop thinking of themselves as a girl and a boy, respectively. However, as youth ends and adolescence begins, their own changing bodies, as well as the changes in how other people treat them, makes them constantly aware of their situation. This is shown most strongly via Yui, as the body that she occupies increasingly becomes that of a man. Her only aspiration was to grow up to be a beautiful high school girl, and she feels more disconnected from her past self by the day. No one treats her like a girl anymore, and her own sense of gender dysphoria rapidly builds as the window of time to be a high school girl is rapidly closing. I don't want to spoil too much, but Shishinki Bitter Change went places that I wasn't expecting and has stayed on my mind long since I put it down. Another series tackling themes of gender and identity is Ore ga Watashi ni Narumade, or Until I Become Me. The series began as a webcomic published via Twitter in 2018 before being picked up for serialization in Comic Walker in 2019 where it remains an ongoing series. Remember what I said about diamonds and rough? The chapters prior to serialization are rough. Personally, I almost dropped the series. Thankfully, it finds a footing after entering serialization and focuses on the parts of the story that work well. So if you do decide to read this one on your own, just giving you a heads up. The story opens with the introduction of the main character Akira, a grade school boy who gleefully bullies the girls in class. In a twist of karmic justice, Akira wakes up one day to find that they have become a girl. Now, Akira finding themselves both loathed by the girls in class for their past behavior and the new target of the other boys bullying. Without other options, Akira's family transfers them to a new school where no one knows about their situation, giving them a blank slate to work from. 
The premise of Until I Become Me is right there on the tin. Japanese doesn't use gendered third-person pronouns like he, she, or they. Gender in Japanese is instead communicated primarily through how a person refers to themselves. Ore is a gruff masculine way of referring to oneself. Watashi is a formal and slightly feminine way of doing the same. Akira, speaking in the voice of a narrator, calls the shot toward the end of the first chapter. Since the story is still in progress, I'm going to be using they them when referring to Akira, however the story seems to be closing in on a telegraph conclusion where Akira settles into a more feminine gender identity. Like a good episode of Columbo, knowing the destination is less important than the process of getting there. One of the things that stands out most about this series is the method of gender bending. Idiopathic sex change syndrome. In this setting, sometimes people just become the opposite sex. No one knows why it happens, and there is no cure. Every time it's mentioned in the story, it gives me the mental image of an old doctor breaking the news to a patient that they've caught a nasty case of gender, and it always cracks me up. Something like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how to tell you this, but you got every gender in there, even several new genders that we've just discovered in you. So there's no grand secret to protect. Akira's teachers, doctors, and family all know what's going on. Moreover, they all seem understanding, even supportive, of whatever Akira decides to do from here on. Trans people also exist in the setting. Early on, a doctor suggests puberty blockers and eventually masculinizing hormone replacement therapy if Akira wants to go back to living as a man. Relatedly, Akira is also given the option to attend a special school for gender diverse kids, some of which have the same condition, where they will still be able to attend as a boy. It's an interesting narrative space to explore in this subgenre. Like Shishunki Bitter Change, this isn't an explicitly trans narrative, but it's only half a step removed from one. Despite the support available, Akira feels guilty about their family relocating. Fears how their family might react if they decide they want to continue living as a girl, and tries to navigate what degree they should out themselves to the friends that they've made. There are also ample moments of gender imposter syndrome where Akira worries about not being a quote unquote real girl. Really, the only thing standing between Akira and being who they want to be is themselves, but that's still a tall wall to climb even when everyone around you seems supportive. Since the story removes the physical element of transitioning via gender influenza, the story can instead focus on the emotional and mental journey Akira goes through while both becoming an adult and deciding what it is they want for themselves. It's a sweet story about how having the space and support to explore doesn't make things easy to figure out. As an aside, it also rules following the series and seeing the author Hatsuki Sato improve both in storytelling confidence and artistic skill as the serialization goes on. All of the works mentioned thus far are separated by both centuries and continents, but they are all part of a long tradition of using fiction to bend and break conceptions about gender. A tradition that has been in place ever since Prometheus got work drunk and accidentally invented gender dysphoria. In some cases, that might look like a man being turned into a woman as a punishment. In others, a woman might find and claim her own sense of masculinity. Or a person's whole body might change, leaving them to make sense of their new relationship with it. Diverse as these stories may be, there are also a few connecting threads that we can pull at. First, they're not real. These are all works of fantasy. As much as these stories might approximate a lived experience or have some real insights to share, these are all deliberately removed from reality. Some of them might even take place in settings that might seem very similar to the real world, but there's always a buffer of unreality between the world of the story and the world that we live in. Second, None of these stories are transgender narratives. Even though stories like Until I Become Me and Shishunki Bitter Change might include moments that could resonate with a trans reader, they are not trans narratives and the characters are not claiming a trans perspective. They're asymptotic. 
coming incredibly close to, but never quite touching the line. Many of these kinds of gender bender stories are situated in a fantasy or science fiction setting. In the real world, bending gender can be a physically, medically, socially, and even legally complicated process. Using magic, science, or gender influenza bypasses all of that and opens the narrative to focus on what the author wants to explore. As a reader, this is a kind of fantasy that resonated strongly with my younger self. These were the kind of stories that invited me to mentally play in a world where being who I wanted to be could be as easy as pressing a button instead of the daunting reality ahead of me. In the crowded niche of gender-bending narratives, there are surprisingly few stories that center on the experience of explicitly transgender characters. Of the few that do, one series casts a long shadow that still extends into the present day. Even more than a decade after concluding a long publication run, it is a series that remains both beloved and controversial. Spoiler warning ahead for Takako Shimura's Wandering Sun or Horo Musuko. Per usual for these kinds of things, I'm not going to do an exhaustive plot summary for this. I don't think those are fun to engage with either as a writer or a reader, or I guess whatever you call those here on YouTube. However, I am going to talk about major themes, historical context of the work, and plot points, as well as how specific characters relate back to those themes. Wandering Sun began publication in Comic Beam in December of 2002 and continued through August 2013, spanning 15 volumes of collected material across an 11-year run. The success of the manga inspired a 12-episode animation adaption of a portion of the story which ran from January to March 2001. Both the manga and animation adaption were received well critically, the Japan Media Arts Festival selected Wandering Sun as a recommended work in both 2006 and again in 2013. The animation adaption was awarded Best Animated Broadcast Release by the Motion Picture and Television Engineering Society of Japan in 2012. Outside of Japan, the Young Adult Library Services Association included the series in their 2012 list of great graphic novels for teens. While not exactly an award, Wandering Sun also has the singular distinction of being the only manga in the 2021 list of 850 titles banned in Texas schools and libraries, almost a full 20 years after the series began publication. It was only Wandering Sun, not any of the other works that deal with gender and gender roles like Revolutionary Girl Utena, The Rose of Versailles, Claudine, The Bride Was a Boy, Our Dreams at Dust, Boys Run the Riot, Strip the Flesh, <gasps> Crossplay Love, Inside Mari, Welcome Back Alice, I Think I Turned My Childhood Friend Into a Girl, Oran High School Host Club, Princess Jellyfish, Stop It Hibarikun, and Ranma One Half. And that's just off the dome of works that I know have English language releases. Never mind other works that deal with romantic relationships between men or relationships between women. The inclusion is even more surprising considering Wandering Sun's troubled localization history. The series was licensed by Fentographic Books, but only the first 8 of 15 volumes were translated before the series was discontinued, citing low sales. If you want to find those volumes in the year of our Lord and Savior Luigi Mario 2024, Expect to pay hundreds of dollars for a little more than half the story. If you want to read the entire thing, your only options are to either import the series and read it in Japanese, or take to the high seas of fan translations. Despite appearing on several best of the decade lists for the 2010s, there is also currently no official way to watch the animation adaption either. Crunchyroll lost the license to the show in 2021, and it hasn't been picked up by any other streaming services. Looking for a Blu-ray? The animation adaption also never had an English home video release. On top of all of that, the series was also produced with 12 episodes, but two of them were combined in the broadcast run of the series, which is the only version that Crunchyroll ever had available. So those scenes that were cut to combine those two episodes were never officially available in English. Were it not for fan translation, 
Wandering Sun, a critically celebrated and culturally important piece of art, would be well on its way to the island of misfit toys. I mean, the island of lost media. After all that talk of bannings and awards, you might expect Wandering Sun to be some lost tome of radical queer fiction buried just beneath Takako Shimura's iconic watercolor cover art. And you'd be mostly wrong. While Wandering Sun is arguably way ahead of its time, the narrative is fairly straightforward. What's radical about it is the earnest and empathic depiction of the kinds of issues that might face a transgender kid. In fact, I've seen the feeling and pacing of Wandering Sun likened to a lazy river, and really, that's better than anything else that I've been able to come up with. The story itself centers on the lives of two kids, Notori Shuichi, or just Shu, and Takatsuki Yoshino, as they move from the fifth grade all the way through the end of high school. Shu wants to be a girl, and Yoshino wants to be a boy. After learning each other's secret, they become confidants, trying to support each other as time passes by on the lazy river of life. As much as they know what they want for themselves, both of them also know that puberty and all that goes with it is just around the corner. Wandering Sun eloquently describes itself as the story of a girl that wants to be a boy and a boy that wants to be a girl. At the start of the series, Shu has just transferred to a new school and quickly becomes friends with Yoshino. Shu is more feminine than most of the girls in the class. Feminine enough that the class actually objects when Shu is cast as Lady Oscar in their gender-bent adaptation of The Rose of Versailles. Really, saying someone is too girly to play Lady Oscar is one of the backhanded affirmations of all time. In contrast, their classmates call Yoshino Takatsuki-kun, an honorific that would typically be reserved for boys. There's also a running bit where members of Yoshino's family will ask if she's aiming for the Takarazuka review. If you've read Wandering Sun already, you know that pronouns in this story can get complicated. Given where they are at the end of the series, I'm going to be using she, her to refer to both Shu and Yoshino. If you're not familiar with the story, or you've only watched the animation, and you're wondering why I might refer to a character that I just introduced as a girl who wants to be a boy with she and her, well, sit tight. I have a lot of thoughts on how this character is handled. In an interview for the 82nd volume of Manga Erotics F, author Takako Shimura noted that she didn't do much planning for Wandering Sun. At the start, she knew that Shu would be a certain kind of boy, and Yoshino would be a certain kind of girl. The rest was pulling from whatever she wanted to write about at the time. Given her lack of planning, and that Shimura is publicly a cisgender woman, it's striking how much Wandering Sun gets right. There are some missteps that might extend from that lack of planning, but even today, there aren't many other works that focus on the experience of trans kids with the same degree of empathy. Personally, I also find it emotionally difficult to talk about. I was a trans kid. From the moment I knew that boys and girls were different, I knew that I wanted to be a girl. I'm one of those people that always knew, but didn't have the means to transition before puberty. I was also around the age of these characters around the time that the story is set, albeit in the United States. There are moments in this story that feel like having my own diary read back to me. More often than not, those are also moments that I would rather not think about. Heck, I even had a similar haircuts issue at the same relative ages and roughly the same physical build. It's uncanny, even uncomfortable sometimes. There are going to be personal anecdotes up ahead as my own experience informs a lot of my readings of the story. Hey, I did warn you about oversharing on the title card after all. Importantly, Wandering Sun is also set in a particular time and place, Japan in the early to mid 2000s. Its themes and characters are correspondingly influenced by the events of the time. So to understand why this series has been so lauded by critics and remains beloved by fans, it's critical to also know the history of LGBT rights and representation in Japan during the decades leading up to its release. So let's learn some of that history before getting back into it. Japan has a long history of homosexuality as well as what we would now label as transgenderism. However, much of that culture was suppressed by the rise of militarism that preceded Japan's entry into the Second World War. 
Following Japan's defeat and occupation by the Allied forces, restrictions on discussions of sexuality and gender identity began to loosen, which opened doors for the quote-unquote gay boom of the 1950s. During this time, mass media began to cover the re-emerging gay culture, the term gay as in G-A-Y gay, having entered the Japanese lexicon via the American occupation forces but localized as G-E-I gay. Gay in this context is written in the katakana alphabet which is used for loanwords but pronounced as a homophone of gay, the kanji for art and performance as well as the first character in the word geisha. Given this connection, it's probably not a shock that the term quickly skyrocketed in popularity and remained popular for decades to come. The gay boom was further propelled by the passage of a 1956 prostitution bill that closed many businesses that catered to heterosexual clientele. However, as there were fewer restrictions on gay bars, as police were inclined to look the other way, many of these businesses were either replaced by or rebranded as gay bars. It was during this period that Shinjuku's second ward was taken over by gay businesses and it still houses the largest collection of gay bars in Japan to this day. Maybe surprisingly, these new bars were not necessarily staffed by or catered to homosexual men. These bars were staffed by Gay Boy, G-E-I-B-O-I, -I, boy having previously been a reference to a bartender or a waiter. Gay Boy would often dress either androgynously or femininely and use feminine mannerisms and speaking styles. This led to a split. The staff at older gay bars that catered to gay men would minimize their femininity, and the newer bars that would play into the spectacle actually became popular entertainment spots for heterosexuals. Over time, the dress and behavior of gay boys working at these bars became more feminine. Leaning into the spectacle was good for business, and also made these bars attractive places to work for both effeminate men as well as people who we would now label as trans women. During this period, gender and sexuality weren't thought of separately. It's a little bit like asking my generally well-intentioned Midwestern mother to explain the difference between a crossdresser, a drag queen, and a trans woman. Effeminacy of any type became synonymous with attraction to men and vice versa. Hence, gay boy is a broad term that refers to a range of gender identities and sexual orientations. Another common term in the post-war era and still used into the present is okama. Written with the kanji for cooking pot, okama is a slang allusion to the passive role in gay sex. It wraps together effeminacy, passivity, attraction to men, and a connotation with prostitution all in one neat package. Okama is a divisive term in modern Japanese queer communities. Some do identify with it, others find it derogatory. The closest equivalent that I can think of in English starts with an F. It's the word that the people that come into the comments section here and call me a skittle person are really itching to call me. And I'm not gonna say it because I don't want to risk getting this video flagged. But I think you know what I'm talking about. Apart from gay boy and okama, the term blue boy also came into vogue after the 1961 Japanese release of the French film European Nights a film partially focusing on a group of Parisian trans performers who had undergone SRS. In response to the popularity of the film, mainstream stories started popping up discussing SRS in the entertainment sphere, which in turn opened doors for trans performers to make the jump into mainstream media. In response, gay boy were encouraged to push their effeminacy further to attract customers, which also made gay bars even more attractive places to work for trans women. After all, this turn of events meant that being trans was actually a marketable skill. However, the blue boy boom did eventually fall off after the 1969 banning of gender reassignment surgery in Japan following what has been historically referred to as the blue boy trial. By the 1980s, blue boy had been replaced by a new term, new half, derived from the concept of being partially man and partially woman, or of an intermediate gender. New halves were performers who had gone abroad to access surgeries and hormone treatments to further feminize themselves. Awareness of the term new half skyrocketed when Matsubara Rumiko won a beauty contest in Roppongi while hiding her trans identity. 
Winning made her the literal cover girl of the nightlife area. Once it was revealed that she was transgender, her popularity exploded. She was in publications, on television. She even released an album titled What Else But New Half. To her enormous credit, she also used her spotlight to stress her womanhood in opposition of the stubborn misconception that trans women were just feminine men who were attracted to men. Saying things like, quote, I have been a woman since the day I was born. Only my body was mistakenly born as male. End quote. In the late 1980s, long-running daytime TV show Warate Itomo, or It's Okay to Laugh, started featuring trans performers on a segment titled Mr. Lady. These segments did allow some of these performers to launch mainstream media careers. However, the content of the show revolved around game show segments and beauty contests, keeping the focus on the spectacle. Consequently, and likely unintentionally, reinforcing the connection between new halves or trans women as performance artists and entertainers first and foremost. In essence, being a new half or a trans woman was not presented as being part of a person's identity, but was primarily understood as a job title. Things did, however, begin to change in the 1990s. The 80s had seen a boom in publications for and by the trans community, as well as the advent of the internet in the early 90s blowing open doors for networking. And while all that was going on, gay and lesbian activists were winning cultural victories by importing both the rhetoric and strategies of the gay liberation movement in the United States. In addition to importing the depathologizing term sexual orientation, activists also popularized the terms gender dysphoria and gender identity disorder. By the mid-1990s, a new public consensus had started to emerge which acknowledged the difference between sex, gender, and sexuality. In 1996, Japan re-legalized reassignment surgery provided that a patient was able to obtain a diagnosis of gender identity disorder. This shift in attitudes and policy was in large part due to the actions of trans men challenging the public perception that transgenderism only existed among trans women in the entertainment industry. The coming out of author, activist, and founder of FTM Nippon, Torai Masae, in particular was a landmark moment in this push for transgender visibility and credibility. For the first time, being transgender was seen not as an abnormality, but as a treatable medical condition. Gender identity disorder had also been initially translated as gender identity disability. Japan has a strong track record of disability rights, so trans activists align themselves with disability advocacy groups to gain both legitimacy and protections. The result? Attention shifted away from the spectacle and toward the types of hardships that a trans person would face in society. This was also reflected in the kinds of media featuring trans characters. For instance, the 2001-2002 season of the long-running drama Sanen Bigumi Kenpachi Sensei, Kenpachi Sensei of Class 3B, focused on the experience of a transmasculine student partially modeled after the experiences of the aforementioned Torai Masae. An episode of the season even had the school's health teacher come in and talk to the class, but by extension, also the audience of the show, about what it means to be transgender medically, socially, and legally. This was a sincere storyline aired as part of a popular series that directly spoke to the struggles facing trans people and specifically those facing trans kids. However, even though reassignment surgery had been re-legalized, there was no legal pathway for a person to update their gender designation in the family registry or koseki. The family registry is referenced for everything from verifying your identity, using national health insurance, obtaining a loan, renting an apartment, or importantly, applying for a job. So without a way to update a person's gender in the family registry, it was impossible to fully legally and socially transition, keeping trans people at the edge of society. The inability to update the family registry was also a contributing reason for the number of trans people working in bars and hospitality where their employers could be a little bit looser with paperwork. In 2001, Torai Masae led a group of other trans people in a lawsuit that would allow them to change their status in the family registry, but they wouldn't be successful until 2004. 
That success is undoubtedly a win. However, the new standards for changing a person's gender designation were strict to say the least. To do so, a person must be over 20 years old, not married at the time, have no children, undergo sterilization, and have external bits similar to the group to which they are being reassigned. On top of that, national health insurance didn't cover surgical interventions until 2018. It's also only recently, and by recently I mean October of 2023, that there have been successful appeals that would allow someone to update their gender in the family registry without undergoing sterilization. In the present day, Japan continues to follow a highly medicalized model for trans care. In order to access treatment, a person needs to conform to certain expectations. In researching for this video, I came across the account of a trans woman who was initially refused care because during the interview process it came out that she was primarily attracted to women. Treating being trans as an illness means that there have to be criteria for diagnosis. If someone doesn't meet those criteria, such as somebody who identified themselves as a new half, or beyond the gender binary of male-female, legal transition or even just being able to access desired care might be difficult or even impossible. I've had my own experience with medical models of trans care. I started my own process in the state of Florida, which also happens to follow a highly medical model. I had to pay out of pocket to see a therapist for about a year before I was allowed to go through the screening for gender identity disorder. The funny story. During the interview, the psychologist that I was working with took off his glasses, shook his head a bit, and said something to the effect of, this is so stupid, why are we even doing this? <sighs> Let's just go on and check the box. Through those preceding sessions, he learned that I was a psychology PhD candidate. He also knew that, as a researcher, I knew how this tool was scored and there was no way to honestly know whether or not I was telling him the truth. It was a waste of time and money, but at least I got a funny story out of it and a piece of paper that says I have gender identity disorder. But that letter did let me get on waitlists for medical care and once I had a letter from a doctor that I was beginning to medically transition, I was able to start updating my gender designation on legal documents which made my life tremendously easier. Strict as that process was, it was still considerably easier than the Japanese system put in place to allow a person to update their gender designation. So let's take all of this together. Wandering Sun debuted over 20 years ago at a time when there wasn't even a legal pathway for someone to update their gender marker in the family registry. It's a story that would still be progressive if it were published today, but was groundbreaking at the time. Author Takako Shimura initially imagined the story as only focusing on a girl who wants to be a boy in the same vein as that Kenpachi Sensei of Class 3B season, but upon thinking about it realized that a boy who wanted to be a girl would also face unique hardships. If you're like me, you might have heard that and your brain went, It feels obvious, but remember how prevalent the notion is that trans femmes were entertainers who were just extremely committed to the bit. For trans femmes, the issue was never visibility, people knew they were there, but rather it was being taken credibly as women. The lack of self-evidence that a boy who wants to be a girl would face unique hardships is more a reflection of where things were at the time, as well as the different perceptions of trans femme and trans mask identities. So Wandering Sun was not only earnestly trying to depict the experience of trans kids, but makes a trans girl a main character at a time when that experience was not well represented in mainstream outlets. For some trans kids, but especially for trans girls, Wandering Sun may have been the first time that they saw their experience depicted in a story without also being cast as side or gag characters. A lot happens across the 15 spanning volumes of Wandering Sun as Shu and Yoshino navigate the unique challenges of their respective paths to adulthood. Throughout, they encounter friction between the people that they want to become and who people expect them to be. Yuki, an adult trans woman who Yoshino meets and who becomes something like a mentor to the two of them, lays it out earlier in the work. 
There were a couple different translations I found for this line, but personally, I'm fond of Kids like you two are rare. Don't lose your nerve. The world isn't set up for people like them. They're square pegs trying to fit into round holes, and the world is already set up to deliberately or passively grind them down. One of the biggest successes of Wandering Sun is how the narrative contrasts the struggles of a boy that wants to be a girl and a girl that wants to be a boy. Shu begins the story aware of her desire to be a girl, but lacking the confidence to put those feelings into words, never mind to do anything about them. Even when other people give her the space to explore, such as Yoshino asking if she wants to try on a dress, she nervously declines. In contrast, Yoshino is able to comfortably move in the cultural space reserved for tomboys. In an early scene, Yoshino is eager to cut her hair very short, practically a boy's cut. While Shu timidly asks for just a trim, unable to say that she wants to grow her hair out. Even at this young age, Shu is aware of how her behavior can and will be policed in ways that Yoshino's will not. In her 2007 book Whipping Girl, Julia Serrano coined the term transmisogyny to describe the unique crossroads of transphobia and misogyny that trans femmes, you know, trans girls and trans women, experience. In society, femininity is devalued in comparison to masculinity. Hence, a girl presenting boyishly, aka striving for masculinity, isn't subversive in the same way as a boy acting girly. For that boy to reject masculinity in favor of a devalued femininity, well that just turns the whole value system upside down. Hence, it's more likely to attract a stronger corrective action. Using the space she has to play with gender, Yoshino borrows a boy's school uniform from her older brother, takes the train a few stops down where no one will recognize her, and for a brief window of time, is able to just exist as a boy. Brimming with confidence after going out, she borrows a girl's uniform from her older sister and gifts it to Shu so that they can both have the experience of being able to just be. Despite initial hesitation, Shu realizes that no one, not even Yuki as another trans woman, has any idea that she isn't just an ordinary girl. Her confidence just continues to build when her performance in the gender-bent Rose of Versailles goes over very well. Her older sister Maho auspiciously blurting out over dinner, You should have been a girl. Shu's older sister Maho is one of the most interesting characters in the story. At different points, she plays the role of gender police, supportive sibling, and occasionally even finds herself caught up in the crossfire of transmisogyny directed at her sibling. When Maho is interviewing for a modeling job and it looks like she might not pass, she pitches that they could also hire Shu, but they're going to come as a package deal. Do not separate them. After the two of them jointly pass the audition, she even starts calling Shu her sister. Eventually, Shu quits modeling after a discouraging run-in with her eventual on-again, off-again girlfriend, Anna. But her relationship with her sister only gets more complicated when the guy that Maho has a crush on develops a crush on Shu after seeing her and femme. A wig and a dress are enough that he doesn't even realize that the girl that he saw and Maho's younger sibling are the same person. As the story treks on, Maho becomes Shu's most vocal critic. But her motivations are complicated. It's undeniable that she loves her sibling. Whenever Shu is being bullied, she either stands up for her directly or nudges somebody else to do it. But she's also worried about what the future might look like for Shu, especially as she gets older and starts having a harder time passing as a girl. Selfishly, she also knows that whatever transmisogyny Shu experiences might also reflect back on her. There's even a pinch of inferiority in the mix. Maho's modeling career doesn't take off the way that she had hoped. Part of her seems to wonder if she only ever got the job because the company really wanted Shu. Her boyfriend, having had a crush on Shu, also remains a hot button issue for her throughout the story. The whole affair has left her with the suspicion that her boyfriend doesn't actually like her as much as she likes him. Whether it's at work, at home, or even in her personal life, Maho is in the shadow of Shu's femininity. In middle school, Yoshino and Shu meet a girl who comes to school in a boy's uniform. 
She has no desire to be a boy, but just wears the clothes that she wants to wear. Her sense of freedom moves Yoshino to take steps towards presenting more masculinely at school, first by wearing a tie instead of a ribbon, and then eventually a full boy's uniform. At best, people think she's cool, and at worst, a teacher might raise an eyebrow. Bright-eyed and brimming with confidence, Shu decides to do the same and wears a girl's uniform to school only to wash up on the rocks of reality. Remember back a couple of minutes to that whole thing about trans misogyny? Before even making it through the school gates, Shu is caught by a teacher and taken to the office along with Yoshino and Chi. When asked why they're each dressing like this, Shu firmly tells the teacher that she wants to be a girl. But when asked, Yoshino can't bring herself to say that she wants to be a boy. After being sent home, Shu starts spending school hours in the nurse's office to avoid bullying. Even Maho catches some of it and also stops going to school, which Shu feels responsible for. If that wasn't enough, Anna, who had been initially supportive, breaks up with Shu, having realized that Shu's desire to be a girl is a more essential part of her than Anna had initially realized. The near universal positive regard that Shu had received up to this point helped her build the confidence to be more open about her desire to be a girl, but now, for the first time, she's starting to waver. The rejection that she's experienced is fomenting into shame and guilt over being who she is. But with the help of her friends, she's eventually able to rejoin the class and finish middle school. However, this junction also sets the tone for the rest of the series. Yoshino both admires Shu and judges herself harshly for being unable to say that she wants to be a boy. Shu's voice has also begun to change. Puberty and all that is going to come with it has finally come for her. For both Shu and Yoshino, the androgyny of youth is over. Young adulthood is here and from this point on, they are increasingly going to be seen and treated as a man and woman respectively. For Shu, her body is becoming increasingly masculine. She's rapidly getting taller, her voice is deeper, her shoulders are broader, and she's finding it harder to pass as a girl in public. Yoshino has stopped growing, her chest has developed, and she's pretty enough to be scouted as a model. While she is praised for her femininity, the more masculine parts of herself are continually undermined by the people around her. For both of them, there's a sense of a gradually loudening voice in the back of their heads asking these nagging questions. What if I'm not cut out for this? Maybe I just drew a bad lot in life. And of course, should I just settle for this? It's an easy trap to fall into. You keep your head down and you take things one day at a time. Focus on what's working and just don't think too hard about the future. If those feelings come back up, just ignore them till they go away and hope they don't come back, even though, as you know, they probably will. Hey, it's what I did until my late 20s and got me a PhD along the way. At this junction in the story, Wandering Sun increasingly focuses on Shu as she becomes the sole main character. Stressed by the changes to her body, Shu considers dropping out of school and going to work in Yuki's bar, but is turned away by the woman that she's looked up to for years. Undeterred, she dresses en femme and starts applying for other jobs, eventually finding one as a waitress after she uses her sister's name and the manager conveniently forgets to ask for her resume. Despite her slighting confidence in herself and much to her surprise, Neither the manager or the customers notice any of the things about her body that she's become uncomfortable with. That is, until a former classmate clocks her and twists her arm into agreeing to be interviewed for a piece she's writing on men who wear women's clothes. This character feels like an insert by the author as a way of speaking directly to misconceptions of trans women. For example, the interviewer is surprised that Shu has a girlfriend, nodding back to that stubborn notion that trans women must be attracted to men. While well-intentioned, large question mark, she is also clearly oblivious. This culminates in her posting candid photos of Shu online without her consent as a bit to promote her writing. The commenters rip into Shu's appearance, pointing out all the things about her body that she's become uncomfortable with. For me, the panels that follow this are some of the most haunting in the series. Shu's inner monologue insists that she's not bothered, it's fine. 
but afterwards every other panel is followed by a cutback to the comments talking about things like her bone structure being clearly masculine and more. The chapter ends with Chu looking in the mirror, drawn as masculinely as she ever is throughout the course of the series, getting ready to shave and muttering, I had so much confidence in myself. This segment in particular is rough for me. I've been on the receiving end of an almost identical situation. Pre-post photos of me were taken from a GoFundMe and posted on a Chan image board. I only found out when a friend of a friend reached out to me and, like a fool, I went to read the comments. What I found were dozens of strangers pointing out things that I didn't even know that I should be insecure about. It's something that I can laugh about now. I mean, one of the comments was talking about how I was wasting my quote-unquote Chad genetics. And enough time has passed since I started my process to admit that I was a pretty attractive man. I don't really show my face in these things, but I am still very attractive, just in a different way. Still, I felt like I was on display, objectified. I also tried to pretend like it didn't bother me, but for days afterwards, I kept thinking about it every time I looked in a mirror. Shu's dissociative response of, this is fine, is a notch or two too real for me. Meanwhile, Yoshino is finding success as a model, so much that she might even be able to make a career out of it. Higher ups in the agency just really dig this whole androgynous thing that she has going on which is just another way that her masculinity is trivialized. Yoshino's desire to be a man hasn't been directly challenged, but it has also never been taken seriously. That lack of rejection or validation, the lack of any kind of response from the people around her, paired with the praise that she's getting while modeling, undermines her confidence and her ability to eventually live as a man. During a meeting with Yuki, Yoshino laments how she never feels like a man. She just feels like someone pretending to be one. Yuki tells her that that's just part of the process. Specifically, she calls it auto-suggestion in the translation that I read. You keep faking it until one day you don't feel like you're faking it anymore. But that doesn't set Yoshino's mind at ease. She wants something concrete to hold on to right now that will let her feel like a man. In their final meeting of the series, Yoshino confides to Shu that she no longer thinks about wanting to be a man as a narrative box reads, One wanted to be a girl, one wanted to be a boy. One stopped wanting to be a boy. That's all there is to it. Shu, however, is still adamant about who she wants to be. After reconciling with Yuki, she finds a job in a different bar run by Yuki's maybe friend, maybe enemy. I really have no idea what's going on with these two. She sort of comes out to her family as well, but directly comes out to Anna who accepts her. The story closes on a panel of a manuscript she was written of the story of her life so far titled, He Said I'm a Girl. As a little Easter egg, that's actually the title of Takako Shimura's debut work and the title of the play that Shu wrote while in middle school. The posters you see for that play in the animation are also the cover art of the story collection named after and featuring He Said I'm a Girl. So welcome to the Takako Shimura cinematic universe. There is a lot to unpack in the ending of Wandering Sun. Seeing Shu go through everything that she did only to finally say directly what she wants for herself was the first time I felt like I was seeing my own lived experience reflected in a piece of media. For all that is going on in Wandering Sun, one of the main through lines is how the different characters manage the unique challenges they face. Each of the characters, whether they be trans or cis, impacts the others and is impacted in return. Over time, these characters eventually form a complicated support network that becomes especially important for the trans characters in maintaining their nerve as they get older. I also have to own that I am reading this as a former trans kid who wasn't able to transition until after puberty. I knew what I wanted, lost my nerve, and eventually had to make peace with who I am. I also tend to process things through writing, which is how I even kind of stumbled backwards into this whole YouTube thing. 
Needless to say, I feel a lot of connection with Shu as a character, and that connection has allowed me to overlook some of the shortcomings of the series. You don't have to dig very hard or very long to find criticism of Takako Shimura's handling of Yoshino at the conclusion of the story. I imagine being someone who started this series expecting a dual protagonist narrative with a trans mask character only to end up here would leave a bad taste in anyone's mouth. If that's the case for you, I recommend a chaser of Kansaki Shin's very excellent series Dear Society. Potentially hot take here, but I don't think that this plot is necessarily a bad thing. I do however agree that there are major stumbles in how it fits within the broader narrative and that it is substantially underwritten. There are two ways to read this final section featuring Yoshino. On one hand, the room could just be blue. She says she no longer thinks about becoming a man and that's it. That's all there is. If I was the kind of person who thinks that a room is simply blue, I wouldn't have written this 23 and counting page script about a nearly 20 year old series. I don't think that a person who is happy with their decision, who feels confident in the choice they're making, and truly no longer considers becoming a man, breaks down in tears alongside the narration, that's all there is to it. The biggest failure here is how there are dots peppered throughout the last sections of the story, but only thin pieces of narrative to connect them. From the point where Shu wears a girl's uniform to school and onward, Yoshino starts to lose her nerve. She watched Shu endure the pushback she did and still be able to say that she wants to be a girl. Yoshino, however, questions whether or not she could do the same in that position. It reminds me a bit of the am I trans enough dilemma. A dilemma that some people develop where they come to believe that the people around them have things more figured out. And any lingering doubt that they have is actually a sign that they aren't trans enough. This is a complicated point. Yoshino is frustrated that she doesn't feel more confident. Yuki tells her that feeling that way is normal and then it's never mentioned again. Fake it till you make it is a piece of advice that I was personally given and one that I've passed on to others. It's the clean cut narratives where someone is suddenly 100% on board that tend to get kicked up by social media algorithms and picked up by major media outlets because they are simple and appealing. In one YouTube person's opinion, it's totally normal to feel like you don't have it all figured out or to be anxious about the future. It would actually be weirder if you didn't. But if you are the kind of person harboring any doubts, which again is totally normal to do, hearing those kinds of stories can rub salt in the wound. This could have been an important message in this story, but it's one that needed more time to develop in the narrative. Instead, it's given a single page of direct acknowledgement before moving on and never mentioned again. Later on, Yoshino stresses over the idea that she's letting down Yuki and Shu by deciding to live as a girl. Neither of them think that at all. It's okay to change your mind is another line that Yuki drops later on after hearing secondhand that Yoshino no longer thinks of herself as a man. Even during their last meeting, Shu reminds her that Yoshino was the person who first told her that she should just wear the clothes that she wants to wear. If anyone is being let down here, it's Yoshino. There is an adjacent conversation to be had here about the prevalence of detransition and desistance. You might have seen a number trotted around that 85% of trans kids will stop identifying as trans later in life. Speaking as someone with a PhD after her name, these studies are, scientifically speaking, methodologically bonk AF. They didn't screen kids for gender dysphoria beforehand, lumped any kind of nonconformity, like a boy preferring the color pink, in with the kids who explicitly said that they were transgender. In one case, researchers even filled in the responses for any kids that they couldn't follow up with. Can you imagine any other medical study, maybe even a drug trial, where the doctors just filled in blank survey forms and then treated those as valid responses? The quality of this research is so bad that a recent paper indexed in the National Library of Medicine posits that desistance is not a useful term in clinical or research discourse, and that the paper is that purport to show it as a common phenomenon can't even agree what it is they're actually talking about. 
Unfortunately, science isn't actually self-correcting. I know, shock, spoilers. But these kinds of zombie theories simply refuse to die and can be easily raised up from the dead by anyone with a megaphone and an agenda. More recent studies with better methodology, such as making sure that the kids in their sample are actually trans, report dramatically lower numbers of desistance, as low as 3-4%. to Even studies that look at adults that do eventually detransition find that the overwhelming majority, in excess of 80%, report that it's not that they stopped being trans, but they were motivated by external factors like social stigma or a lack of social support. Detransition and desistance are real, but they are uncommon and they are complicated. I sincerely doubt that Takako Shimura was aware of all this when writing Wandering Sun. As a reader though, it's hard for me to accept that Yoshino is so adamant about wanting to be a boy earlier in the story only to end up where she does. There's also the issue of the ending itself. The resolution of Wandering Sun doesn't feel very much like an ending. It feels transitional, like it's meant to be the bridge into a fourth major arc or into another series altogether. The end is the beginning is the end. Yoshino's situation more than any other characters would have benefited from an epilogue. So here's my pitch. The characters meet again after five to ten years. As readers we get to find out what happened with Shu's writing, we catch up with the relationships between the different characters, but Yoshino doesn't show up until everyone is already packing up. As the group is splitting, Yoshino privately confides to Shu that she's reconsidered and decided she wants to live as a man. If it's alright to change your mind, then it's also alright to change your mind again. The winding path that it took to get to this point, making Yoshino the titular wandering sun. Curtains close, fade to black, Finn. Takako Shimura does have a history of inserting characters she's fond of into later works, so maybe something like this could still happen. But then again, the room could also just be blue. A second but lesser criticism is less about how a character is handled in the ending, but how a character is introduced. Yuki is the adult character in the series given the most development. Like an ogre and or an onion, she's also layered in a way that makes her very fun to talk about in these kinds of videos. As you peel back those layers, it can start to become hard to tell for certain what are truths, what are half-truths, and what are whole lies. Really, who doesn't love a messy gay adult mentor figure? Yuki enters the story as Yoshino starts going out by herself in a guy's school uniform. While she's sitting and eating, Yuki offers to buy her something and slides Yoshino her phone number. Eventually, both Shu and Yoshino start to hang out around Yuki at her house. When Yuki's partner Shina comes home and finds the kids there, he assumes that Yuki is up to something weird and brashly grabs Yoshino's crotch, thinking she's a cis boy. It feels like the kind of thing out of a raunchy arrow gag manga, but feels completely out of place in a story like this. It's hard to find a good reading of this segment. At best, it's an off-color element that detracts from the character. At worst, it's playing into harmful stereotypes of predatory gay adults. It's also possible that Yuki had clocked Yoshino and Shu and was trying to be supportive to two trans kids, but even then, it still kinda sucks. Thankfully, the animation adaption skips this portion of the story entirely, so it's neither shown or referenced. Considering that Yuki plays a major supportive role in the lives of both characters for the remainder of the story, and that Takako Shimura made her the protagonist of the short story The Flower, I doubt Shimura wrote her with the intention of playing into a homophobic stereotype. Even setting aside her introduction, Yuki is certainly overly friendly with, and likely overly attached to the kids, although that builds into a larger reading of the character. She may seem put together between her domestic life with Shina and owning a bar, but there's also a heavy sadness to her character as well. She does a lot to hide it, but now and then it peeks out from behind the mask. Yuki sees a lot of herself in Shu especially, although she notes that the biggest difference between them is that she never had any friends. 
My reading here is that Yuki's attachment to the kids is a reflection of her own carefully hidden immaturity as well as a desire to vicariously relitigate her own painful childhood. When Shu comes to visit her for support after being sent home for wearing a girl's uniform, Yuki shares a part of her own past, prefacing it with the line, let me tell you half a story. In school, Yuki was constantly bullied until she stopped going, having even been forced to wear a girl's uniform and confess to a boy that she didn't even like. Because the world of Wandering Sun is a very small place, it also happens that Yuki went to the same middle school as Shu and Yoshino. When the pair invite her to visit and see a play that their class is putting on, she walks through the halls with Sheena, pointing out the bathrooms she was beaten up in, the lockers she was pushed into, and the closets she was locked in, all with a smile on her face. And if that's the half of the story that she's willing to share, one has to wonder what it is that she's holding a little closer to her chest. Her family life isn't much better. In the main story, she's no longer welcome in the family home. In the side story, The Flower, she's been called back home after her parents saw her on a variety show special spotlighting trans women. At that point, her mother refuses to face her. Social support is a major way that the kids in Wandering Sun deal with setbacks, but Yuki never had that. Instead, she's learned to stay on guard, never really putting her genuine self out there. When she visits the school, she puts on an ill-fitting suit to try and fail to pass as a man. It's the last piece of men's clothing she owns and a gift from her mother. In the animation, we see her being fitted for it as her mother looks on proudly, but Yuki looks like she's crawling in her own skin. There's clearly a lot of feeling tied up in this suit, so why is she wearing it? She also doesn't even wear it when she's called back home in the flower. We know that the school is a source of a lot of trauma for Yuki. When Shinra tries to get Yuki to attend their middle school reunion, she refuses to get out of bed. He tries to coax her out, telling her that she can dress up, be beautiful, and stunt on all of them. That all that can just be in the past. And Yuki turns around and snaps at him. Because it's not in the past for her. This is one of the only moments where we start to see cracks in her facade. Wearing the suit, using her legal name, and trying to pass as a man in the school means that no one can take her femininity from her. It's all a shield to cover up her lingering emotional wounds. It's also part of my read on why she chooses to refer to herself as an okama, a term that, remember, some see as derogatory and also one that outs her immediately. You can't be shot with Chekhov's gun if you fire it first. No one can clock her if she outs herself. No one can call her a slur if she says it first. In doing so, she puts them on the defensive and takes that power away from them at the cost of her own self-worth. The suit is an extension of that. No one can invalidate her femininity if she hides it away. Shu had friends to lean on. Yuki had to figure out how to never need them. What might someone in her position have had to go through to get to where she is now? The major difference between Shu and Yuki is itself a reflection of the progressing acceptance of trans identities taking place in the lead up to and during Wandering Sun's publication run. For all the sadness in the character, Yuki also clearly cares a lot about Yoshino and Shu. However, when Shu asks to work in Yuki's bar, she's turned away. Proprietors of gay bars like Yuki are more than just employers. For the people working there, they are also guardians and mentors, hence going by the name Mama. Shu isn't just asking for a job, she's asking Yuki to take on an almost maternal role in her life. It's also implied that Shu plans on dropping out of school, which is the real reason that Yuki turns her away, but she still doesn't accept Shu after she graduates high school, so there must be something else up. I wonder if a character like Yuki, with such a carefully managed front stage and backstage persona, might have parts of herself that she doesn't want Shu to see, or if she doesn't want Shu to get any closer to her than she already is. Instead, Yuki connects her with Lulu, her enemy, friend, yeah, I, I don't know, there's something going on here. She's the same Lulu that Yuki mentions in The Flower. In the short story, she says that her close friend Lulu was murdered by her boyfriend after he found her cheating, but Lulu seems to be doing alright. 
She also knows that Yuki goes around telling people that story and has some choice words of her own. If this is how Yuki gets along with someone that she trusts, someone that she trusts enough to refer Shu to them, I'd hate to see what her enemies have to say about her. On a more serious note though, these interactions do make you realize how Yuki doesn't seem to have any adult friends outside of Shina and maybe some of the people who work for her. The kindness that she shows to the kids in the series as they get older might actually be a reflection of what she had hoped someone could have done for her. So that introduction just casts an unfortunate cloud over an otherwise very compelling character. Less a failure, and more an unfortunate product of circumstance, is how the character Makoto is handled in the animation adaption. Makoto, or Mako-chan as she asks to be called, is also a trans girl. Unlike Shu though, she is principally attracted to men. Trying to untangle her gender identity and sexuality is a major part of her character arc. It's also an important thing to represent in a story like this considering the historical conflation of trans women and gay men in Japan. However, the resolution of that process happens in the final chapters of the story after the animation was already airing, so Makoto was written to eventually understand herself as a gay man instead of as a straight woman. Shu and Makoto's relationship is complicated. On one hand, they give each other the space to talk about their desire to be girls and support each other the best they can. On the other hand, freckled and bespectacled, Makoto is jealous of Shu's effortless cuteness. When she's cast as Juliet in the gender-bent version of Romeo and Juliet, Yuki, albeit not knowing Makoto is trans at the moment, tells Makoto to her face that it's unfortunate she was cast as Juliet and not Shu. Surely, that will not become a trauma that Makoto is going to hold on to for years afterwards. Like the other kids, Makoto gradually starts to lose her nerve. At the climax of her story, her mom, who is the mommest of moms and pretty Midwestern coded IMHO, patronizingly brushes aside Makoto's long expressed insecurity about her appearance prompting Makoto to come out to her as trans in the most direct way of anyone else in this series. Rather than rejecting her kid, Makoto's mom instead tells her that if she wants to be cuter, she should start wearing makeup or consider getting plastic surgery then. After all, cute girls put in a lot of effort one way or another. Is this the best response? Hell no. Is it messy? Hell yes. But does she love her kid? Undoubtedly. Makoto's mom isn't the most tactful. Maybe it's all the Midwestern coding. She's really going to work here with the parental equivalent of a hammer, but she immediately starts treating Makoto as her daughter without a second thought. Like Shu, Makoto also applies to work at Yuki's bar. Of course, being the most Midwestern of Japanese mothers, Makoto's mom comes with her to also talk to Yuki. Given how Yuki was disowned by most of her owned family, she's expecting the waterworks. Instead, Makoto's mother gets on her knees and bows, asking Yuki to please take care of her son. Yes, it's unfortunate she still calls Makoto her son, but her heart is in the right place. Also bear in mind that Yuki is someone who doesn't exactly live in polite society. It's not even a secret. Shu and Yoshino clock her as being a part of the nightlife almost immediately while they are still both in primary school. So I imagine that this kind of thing doesn't exactly happen to her often. Makoto's mom's love for her kid is so overt and so powerful that Yuki, whose facade had been starting to slip, channels the spirit of Universal Century Gundam wondering if Makoto's mom might actually be a new type. And yet, this scene of a parent who might not know all the right words, but knows that they love their kid, has never been officially available in English. Outside of fan translations, one of the most overt displays of love for another person, and one of the most powerful moments in this series, is otherwise inaccessible. Before moving away from talking about the work itself, and while we're on the topic of love, I have to admit that I'm a big fan of sandwiches, whether they're in triangles, squares, or script construction. 
After going through some fumbles, stumbles, and failures, I want to close this section on a positive that ties together these themes of social support, displays of love, and maintaining confidence when the world seems bent on wearing you down. And that's Shu's evolving relationship with Anna throughout the series. Anna and Shu first meet during Shu's short career as a model. There's a running gag in the series where characters assume that Anna is kind of a petty villainess, which isn't even exactly unfair. During her introduction, she is arguably the single cruelest character in the series. It also doesn't help that she's a shy girl that keeps other people at a distance and struggles to express her feelings. It's also possible that the difference in her behavior between her introduction and later on is another example of Takako Shimura writing a character's introduction without a long-term plan before pivoting to something else. Personally, I prefer to think of her initial behavior as an example of taking her work as a model way more seriously than a kid or really anyone should take their job. Through her work as a model, Anna becomes friends with Shu's older sister Maho, which in turn leads to her eventually getting to know Shu, and the two eventually begin dating. As readers, we only get brief windows into Anna's changing relationship with Shu's femininity. She's always aware of it. After all, she's known Shu likes dressing as a girl since literally the moment they met. At first, she thinks of it as Shu wanting to look like a girl compartmentalizing Shu's femininity as a quirk and not a core part of who she is as a person. Shu wearing a girl's uniform to school quickly makes that untenable. In their reconciling though, Shu, dressed in character for their class's gender-bending play, tells Anna that she still likes her, but understands if the way that she is would bother her. It turns out that the things that Anna initially liked about Shu, like her ability to talk about her emotions, are actually some of her more feminine traits. Early into the story, Anna likens Shu to a little sister, but even as her relationship with Shu and Shu's femininity changes, Anna never wavers in supporting her partner. By the time Shu is entering high school, Anna is the one asking Shu to go on dates with her and femme. Not only does she come to understand Shu's femininity as a central part of who she is, but Anna gradually realizes that she's attracted to Shu as a woman. She even catches herself eventually fantasizing about Shu wearing a cheerleading outfit. There's a fun moment later on where Shu is wearing the outfit around her and mentions going to take it off, but Anna cuts her off and tells her to leave it on without missing a beat. After being introduced to Yuki, she directly asks Shu if she also wants to be like that, which I read as whether or not Shu intends to transition. And when Shu confirms it, Anna just smiles and jokes about how she's fallen in love with the weirdo. So maybe it shouldn't be a shock that Anna barely bats an eye when Shu does finally tell her directly that she wants to be a girl. Looking down and bracing for rejection, instead Shu sees her girlfriend crack a little smirk and ask if this means that she gets to be a lesbian. It even sounds like being lesbian is something that she's excited about. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up. The name that Lulu gives Shu when she's first hired to work at the bar is Lily, albeit it's Lily spelled in katakana. However, Lily in the kanji alphabet is what? Yuri. What did Ito Bungaku, editor of gay men's magazine Barazoku, call the section he added for gay women? Yurizoku, or Lily Tribe. What do we call the subgenre of romantic fiction for women who love women? Yuri. Actually, named after Yurizoku, where authors could publish their lesbian romance stories. Once again, it seems that Yori Miyazawa, author of Other Side Picnic, might have been onto something. Just like an empty park bench, an open field, or two ships passing in the night, this too is Yuri. Wandering Sun was Yuri all along. It would be one thing for Anna to tell her girlfriend that she'll support her, or that it doesn't matter if she's a man or a woman. Instead, Anna very specifically recodifies their relationship as lesbians. In doing so, She's not just expressing her acceptance of Shu as a woman. She's claiming a queer identity for herself, an identity that you can see developing alongside her girlfriends. 
Keep in mind that even as of writing this, Japan has yet to fully nationally legalize same-sex marriage. We know from an earlier conversation that Anna had been thinking about a future with Shu, having first been unable to envision one but later confidently declaring that, although prior to Shu coming out to her, she doesn't care if other people see them as a crazy old lady married to a crazy old man in women's clothing. Anna loves Shu as a woman in love with another woman, and she has to know that the road ahead for them isn't going to be easy, but she knows that they're going to be walking on it together. It's really hard to get across just how I feel about this scene, so instead of gushing about it, I'm just going to set these panels to the finale of the 1812 Overture for a bit. thread to her developing lesbian identity is how Anna becomes the target of secondhand homophobia and transphobia. At first, the call is coming from inside the house as she works through her own internalized issues. Later, it's mostly coming from Maho who pushes Anna to break up with Shu or presses her on how she isn't bothered by Shu's dressing as a girl. Rather than giving Maho big dramatic rebuttals, Anna's responses are short and to the point. The flat delivery of her responses like, why does it bother you so much, turning that question back on Maho. Toward the end of the series, after years of being around Anna, Maho even seems to have worked through some of her own homophobia. The importance of Anna's support for Shu is an understated part of the narrative, but not one that is necessarily underwritten. I wouldn't complain about having more scenes between them, but it's sweet and maybe best enjoyed in moderation. Wandering Sun is a polarizing work. It seems that folks tend to fall in one of two camps, either being highly critical of it or uniformly positive, but almost everyone who reads it has some kind of reaction. Having been a trans kid around the ages of these characters around the time that the story is set, I don't know how I would have reacted if I had read it when I was younger. I expect that I would have pushed it away out of shame but lost sleep thinking about it. As an adult, I have complicated feelings about it. It's a story of highs and lows, thankfully more highs than lows, but it's hard to overlook some of the underwritten portions toward the ending and questionable inclusions toward the front. Still, the series has stuck with me since I first read it many years ago and I imagine that it's going to stay with me for many more to come as it has with other readers. It has been over a decade since Wandering Sun finished publication in 2013, but the series has managed to remain relevant, especially in LGBT circles. This is probably at least partly due to the series focusing on presenting a grounded story about trans kids. There have been a number of series dealing with gender identity since then, but the vast majority of those stories tend to lean into magical realism. Other media that does explicitly depict trans characters in grounded stories, like the TV drama Last Friends or Chi's very wonderful autobiographical manga The Bride Was a Boy, tend to focus on the experience of trans adults. Stories that center the experience of trans kids, especially trans kids over time as they grow up, are few and far between. Of those few series, Fumiko Fumi's 2012 Bokura no Hentai is a standout. The title of the series can be read a number of ways, either as our perversion, our abnormalities, our transformation, or our metamorphosis. The 10 years separating the beginning of Wandering Sun and Bokura no Hentai are reflected in where and how their narratives diverge in their treatment of their trans characters. The series opens with three kids meeting for the first time after having connected via a cross-dressing website. Osamu Tamura and Ryosuke Kijima are both boys who engage in cross-dressing for their own reasons, while Marika Aoki is a trans girl who is hoping to meet people who could understand her. Unlike the other two who see their femme presentations as a persona, Marika instead sees her public life as a boy as cross-dressing. 
Like Shuichi in Wandering Sun, Marika finds the boy's uniform at her school suffocating, likening it to something you would wear to a funeral. In flashbacks, we see that Marika has insisted on being a girl from a very young age. Bullied for her femininity, she eventually gave up and started presenting as a boy. It was after seeing a trans woman on television and searching the internet for how she could be like her that Marika first found that website that led her to the opening scene of the story. Also like Shuichi, she finds connection with another student, Satoshi Natsume, a boy who insists on wearing a hand-me-down girl's uniform from his older sister. Satoshi has no desire to actually be a girl and can't fully understand why being a girl is so important to Marika but he's still supportive. In fact, his support is a major reason that Marika's story turns out so differently than Shuichi's. When Marika visits Satoshi's home for a sleepover, she's surprised when his family calls her Marika without needing to be asked, Satoshi having already explained her situation. Of his three older sisters, Ayumu is an avid cosplayer and offers to teach Marika more about makeup and fashion. She also happens to know about another trans woman and notices that Marika's voice is starting to change. This ends up being the pivotal moment in Marika's story. Satoshi's entire family springs into action. As it turns out, another of Satoshi's older sisters is a nurse who helps connect Marika with a gender clinic. The other sisters also help build up Marika's confidence for the eventual talk that she's going to need to have with her mother. In a positive turn, Marika's mother is immediately accepting, even saying that she already suspected and wishes that she had done something for Marika sooner. Within chapters, Marika has passed the screening, taken a short leave of absence from school, and resumed attendance as a girl. To Fumiko Fumi's enormous credit, she consulted both a doctor and a trans woman on Marika's story arc knowing that it was something that she needed to get right. And after rejoining her class, Marika's classmates are immediately supportive, as are the faculty. From this point on, Marika's transness becomes largely a non-issue. And aside from one incident where she overhears another student talking about her negatively, she also doesn't have any problems with the other students. That incident also ends with the student's friends pointing out that he's obviously just uncomfortable admitting that Marika is cute. It's hard not to compare and contrast Marika's narrative with Shu's. When Shu wears a girl's uniform to school, she tells her teacher that she's wearing it because she wants to be a girl. At home, Maho even tells their parents that Shu wants to be a girl. Even her dad tells her a whole story about how her grandmother had lost a bet with her grandfather by putting money on Shu being born as a girl and how maybe she was actually right after all. The people around her know what she wants, but no one really seems to know what to do with that information. Even the people who seem like they might be accepting just kind of shrug and move on. The major difference between Shu and Marika's narratives isn't what they want for themselves. It's the people around them knowing how to help them. In a 2005 survey of over 6,000 youths in Japan, 79% of them reported learning nothing about sexual minorities in class. Another 15% reported learning they were abnormal. Asking trans kids to navigate the complex legal, social, and medical situations they might find themselves in on their own all before the onset of puberty is a Herculean task. Actually, correction. A trans kid could probably figure out how to clean those stables. I don't know if Hercules could figure out how to schedule a screening for gender identity disorder. Japanese medical guidelines from 2013, just a year after Boko no Hentai began publication, allowed for puberty suppressing drugs to be prescribed to kids at the age of 12 until 15 when they would be able to begin hormone replacement therapy. However, what is a 12 year old supposed to do with that information without a support network to help them? It's not a wonder why so much anti-trans legislation here in the United States aimed at trans kids is actually aimed at criminalizing the behavior of supportive adults. The contrast between how these stories handle their trans characters is a sign of positive change, both in the representation of trans characters as well as the proliferation of knowledge about what it means to be trans. 
In the same way that the difference in Yuki and Shu's experiences in Wandering Sun reflects broader social changes, so too do the differences between Shu and Marika. The first time I read Bokura no Hentai, I thought Marika's situation was just as fantastical as Gender Influenza or the portal that transits your gender. It's the same kind of feeling that I get when I hear about trans kids with supportive homes. That just wasn't a thing when I was growing up. But I'm so glad to see that other kids are not being forced to go through what I did. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. To my surprise when doing research for this video, I found that discourse around Wandering Sun seems to have turned against it. It does hit a certain way, seeing something that felt very personally relevant to your own lived experience talked about as unrealistically cruel or even transphobic. Maybe this is just a sign that I'm finally old enough to feel a generation gap. It reminds me a little of the never-ending discourse on bad representation. Yes, I will agree that Wandering Sun isn't perfect. Both the handling of Yuki and Yoshino in particular leave a lot to be desired. The more time I've spent with the work making this video, I've both fallen more in love with it and found it more frustrating. Even though far as I've been able to find, Takako Shimura didn't mention consulting with any trans people about their experience when writing the story, Wandering Sun manages to get so much right and yet still stumbles into some seemingly avoidable pitfalls. Even with my misgivings though, it's hard to agree that the work isn't valuable. The 2015 Attitudes Towards Sexual Minorities in Japan survey found that 90% of respondents believed there wasn't a single homosexual person in their immediate social networks. Educational programs, variety shows, films, dramas, and of course manga are how many people are first exposed to LGBT people and begin to build empathy. Especially for LGBT kids in school systems that don't include education on LGBT issues like many schools in Japan, media is a major way for them to begin learning about themselves. So instead of writing the story off wholesale, I would rather be realistic about where it fails and acknowledge it as a historical text set at a particular time in a particular place. Wandering Sun is not a feel-good story. Even in its most optimistic readings, it is still a bittersweet tale about characters that deserved better. But a story making you uncomfortable isn't necessarily flawed for doing so. Being able to elicit a strong reaction in a reader can actually speak to a strength of storytelling. The strength of Wandering Sun's storytelling is felt most in how the story handles the theme of acceptance and the resolution of Shu's story. Before the onset of puberty, she was able to pass as a girl effortlessly, often even accidentally. Now her body has changed and her confidence in herself as a woman is wearing away. In high school, one of her teachers gives the class a writing assignment, which inspires Shu to begin writing down her story. The story that we as readers have been following this entire time. There is a recurring callback to the idea of dreams throughout Wandering Sun. In the first mention, Shu can't quite get the words out. The chapter ending with an incomplete, my dream is, dot dot dot, in the image of the dress that Yoshino had given her. In high school, she wonders what her dream even is anymore, eventually landing on a blacked out panel with bold lettering, my dream is to make peace with my dream. As a child, her dream was simply to be a girl. As an adult, her dream is to make peace with a dream that can never come true. It's easy to get lost imagining all the myriad ways my life could have been, even should have been different. I've lost many hours over the years thinking about what ifs. What if my parents hadn't scolded me for picking out a girl's bike when they took me to pick out my first one? What if I hadn't been bullied at school and called slurs at home? Or what if I had been born just a few years later and been able to take puberty blockers? Sometimes I'll even try to imagine what kind of girl I would have been. My cousin did dance, and maybe that's something that she would have been into. Without being bullied, maybe she wouldn't have ended up being so shy. Maybe she'd even be popular. My sister and some of my relatives were scouted for modeling and maybe she'd be very pretty. 
Maybe she would have kept singing instead of avoiding speaking as her voice started to change. Maybe she wouldn't throw up in a hotel room because she was so nervous going out in public cosplaying Ellie Ayase from Love Live. Maybe she wouldn't go through that string of dating people only to later find out they were Nozomi Tojo cosplayers. Or maybe she wouldn't lie when a therapist asked her if she wanted to be a girl because she was afraid to find out that her parents' love was conditional on being their son. No matter how much time and energy I spend imagining who this other self might be, one thing is consistent. She isn't real, and I am. These kinds of fantasies are like a warm fire. At a distance and for a time, they can be comforting. But if you stay too long or you get too close, you're going to get burned. These kinds of feelings are best acknowledged and let go, as hard as that may be. Reading from Shu's story within a story, I've always wanted to be a girl. To be a girl and be able to wear a girl's clothing all the time. Maybe what I wanted was an outside that would be accepted. An outside so I wouldn't stand out at school. An outside so I wouldn't be scolded by my parents. An outside that no one would talk about me behind my back. An outside that people would accept. I couldn't get that outside I wanted. I have a blessed, warped outside. Just like in her story, what's been written in her life has been written. Shu can only accept what's happened to her and move on. However, there is another idea threaded into that last line. I have a blessed and warped outside. A while back, I came across the idea of finding ways to show appreciation for the things that have happened to you, both the good and the bad. It's a powerful idea to end on, and one that I can't say I've seen handled better in another piece of transmedia. Showing appreciation is hard to do. Honestly, I struggled to do it, but on good days, sometimes, I can appreciate how the same things that hurt me have also made me a kinder and tremendously resilient person. The kind of person who might be able to give someone else the kind of support that she needed but didn't get, and pay forward the support that she did. There will always be things about my body that I notice that others don't seem to. There are things about my voice that I hear that others don't. I expect that that will probably never change. But as hard as it can be, all I can do is accept that those things are part of me. Those feelings have to be acknowledged and let go. I can't change the past, but I can try to be my happiest in the future. I too have a blessed and warped outside. A body that has changed in ways that it shouldn't have had to, but still remains beautiful. And maybe things should have been different. But that doesn't mean that the life that I have isn't one worth living. And that's what I've got for this time. So, until next video, be nice to yourself.